Almighty God, the author of everlasting life, the giver of every good and perfect gift. Thank you, God. We are coming to Thee in the name of Thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. And we humbly thank Thee, Lord, for the blessings that Thou hast given us. And I pray that You will touch the sister who is now Thank sick God. somewhere in this audience. We, as the church of the living God, we now ask that the evil spirit that would do the harm to our sister yes, will Lord. depart from her, that she might enjoy the services yes, tonight mm. in the presence of the Lamb of God. We ask you, Father, to bless Brother Joseph Bose as he leaves for Africa and to minister in the parts of the world. Let thy hand of Hallelujah. mercy guide him, Lord. Hallelujah. Give him safety. Give him health and strength. And may he return to us again rejoicing, bringing precious sheaves. Hallelujah. Granite. Forgive us of our sins yes, as we forgive those who sin against us. Yes, Lord. And we pray now that the Holy Spirit will all together take the meeting under His control Hallelujah, and get glory to God our Father. For we ask it in His name. Amen. Be seated. <clears throat> I do not have the, the vocabulary to say how I appreciate this great Chicago and their cooperation in these past eight nights of meeting to all the churches and to the peoples. It is so highly appreciated. And I appreciate this Lane Tech High School Auditorium. And to the custodian and to all those who are affiliated in this school. They have been so kind to us to let us have it. And I want to especially thank the fine music and the singers. The little quartet just sang a few moments ago of the Youth for Christ from Wisconsin. We thank them. And for our precious colored friends... I just walked into the room there and they were singing that song that ought to shake every sinner to his knees. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure. I was thinking after that stirring film last night that our brother Osborne showed here, of their people way over there in Africa laying sick and Oh, we feel ashamed of ourselves for not taking the gospel to them sooner than this. But by the grace of God, we will do, I will do all that I can for them as I go back again. And for the brother Johnson, the, the singer, how beautifully he sang for us. And we appreciate him. And for the pianist and all, and for the ministers, their cooperation, and for our precious little brother, Joseph. He's gone out now, I believe. But Joseph has been a real buddy to me. I love the little fella. And we've stood by each other. I say little fella. I know that he's larger than I am, but there's just something about him that, oh, he just... I just love him. Such a wonderful little fellow. I love him because that he loves our Lord. And I've seen Joseph in many tight places, but I've never seen him behave himself any less than the Christian. And everything that he did, and through thick and thin, we have stood by each other. And may God bless our love for each other as we continue on. And to you other ministering brothers that's been in the meetings, someday when it's all over, and just think when all these great choirs gather together, 
Won't it be wonderful? You might say, Brother Branham, do you believe that they'll still have their talent? Certainly. Sure. They were given that forever. If you notice when the witch of Endor called up the spirit of Samuel, he was still a prophet. <laughs> so death only moves us from a different place of abiding. This is just for a little while and that one's eternal. So we're looking to that day. I heard Brother Joseph announce the meetings. We would be glad to have you. And that choirs and things, come on over to these meetings. I'd sure love that. And I'm sure the people would too. Nothing like good singing, is there? Oh, it's wonderful. Now, tonight being the closing night, and of course I'm always just a little tired. And get hoarse. I, I haven't got an, an official campaign manager at these times. Since our dear precious brother, Ern Baxter, had to return to his church, it was calling for him. His church is almost the size of this auditorium. So to be getting around across the country with me, his church wouldn't stand for it any longer. He had to return back to them or they'd probably lose his church. A wonderful soul, a wonderful man of God, and I love him. But he had to go back, and since then... Uh, I haven't had a campaign manager, so I have to try to speak myself. So I'm insufficient for that because I'm not an educated person and I can't preach. We know that, as Brother Osborne said on the platform last night about, he said, no one knows it any better than he did about his will of being here. So... But you suffer with us a little while, but I love to tell what I know about him, for I love him. I wish to read tonight a portion of the scripture, and we will not keep you too long. Then we're going to pray for the sick. And oh, how my heart burned last night when I seen that great, massive group of people come into the aisles to accept their healing on the basis of God's eternal word. That thrilled my heart. It brought my faith up in you to see that you would believe right on the word. Brother Osborne has a great ministry of preaching the word and the word will defeat the devil anywhere, anytime, under any conditions. Jesus proved it. When he defeated Satan, not using his power, but just on the word of the Father. It is written. It is written and he defeated him. In the book of the revelations of Jesus Christ, and uh, the third chapter and the 20th verse, I wish to read this potion. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. This is a most striking text of scripture. There's something about it that each time when I read it, it just thrills my heart. It's a picture of the Lord knocking at the door. I cannot call in my memory at this time the picture or the artist that the picture was painted by him of this event. But all famous pictures, before they can ever be put into the Hall of Fame, they first have to go through the critics. And then when they have passed through the critics, then they can go into the Hall of Fame. That's the way it is with the church. God is painting a picture of a beautiful, 
holy church. And before it can ever be taken from the earth to the hall of fame in the palace of God, it first must pass down the line of the critics. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions. Blessed are ye when man shall say all manner of evil about you falsely for my name's sake. And this artist painted the picture of Jesus knocking at the door. When it went through the critics, one rose and said, Sir... There's just one thing that I can find wrong with the picture. That is, you do not have any latch on the door. And the artist said, oh no, I painted it that way. He said, that door is the door to the heart. And the latch is on the inside. You have to open the door. And we would wonder as we see knocking at the door. What does a man knock on the door for? He's trying to gain entrance. He wants to come in. And that's his reason for knocking. Many great men in this great wide world and in its years that it's existed has knocked on doors. And I'm thinking now, what would take place if the great Caesar would have come down to the door of a peasant and uh, knocked at the door? When the peasant opened the door and could have seen who it was knocking, he would have probably prostrated himself on the floor and said, Welcome, great Caesar. Just come into my house and honor me by coming into my humble abode. And whatever you find... In here that your heart desires, take it, for it's yours. What would have took place if the late Adolf Hitler would have come down to the door of one of his soldiers and would have knocked at the door and the soldier looking out and would have seen that it was the great fear of Germany. The soldier would have swung open the door and stood at attention and saluted the great German fear and asked him to come in. And anything you want in my house, take it. It's yours. If Hitler would have said, I'll take that golden clock sitting on the wall for a souvenir, though no matter how valuable it would have been, the soldier would have been honored to have given such as that to the German fear. You know, the reason... It's the importance of the person at your door. When an important person comes to visit you, there's not a good Democrat in all of Chicago tonight. But what would feel highly honored if President Dwight Eisenhower knocked on his door? Though he differed with him in politics, yet he is the president of the United States of America. 
He's an important man. And just any good Democrat would appreciate that. The honor of having the president of these United States, President Dwight Eisenhower, to knock at his door. He would say, come in, sir. And anything that I can do to make you comfortable while you're here, enter in. His heart would have been thrilled to know that the President of the United States was knocking at his door. For he would know that the President had a mission for him or to something to tell him or he wouldn't be knocking at the door. Just recently, the Queen of England Visit our lovely nation. The daughter of the late King George, whom it was my privilege by God's grace to pray for when he was here with multiple sclerosis. And she being here in the United States, if she would have come to any of our doors and knocked at the door, we'd have been... Highly honored to have the Queen of England knock at our door. Though we are not her subjects. But she's so important. That's why we'd feel honored at her knocking at our door. She's an important woman. She's the greatest queen on the earth. Nationally speaking. And we'd have had honor for her to come. But oh, who's more important than Jesus? And who's more turned away than Jesus? Who's greater than he is? And yet he stands and knocks daily and we turn him away. He wants to gain entrance to our heart so that he can bless us and do for us that what no king or potentate or any other important person could do. And yet we turn him away. Daily, thousands times thousands turn him from their heart's door. It's the greatest honor that any man or woman or child could ever have is to have the Lord Jesus to knock at your heart's door. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. And yet he's turned away more than the newspaper man or the book salesman or the brush company or the some other person that comes to take from you instead of give to you. And there's no one else could knock at your door with such a gift as he has for you. For he has for you eternal life. He has for you healing for your body. He has joy for your sorrow. He has peace for your troubled mind. He has hope for your doubts. Faith for your fears. Incorruption for your corruption. Life for your death. And still we turn him away. But you might say to me, Brother Branham, I've already did that. When Jesus knocked at my heart, I let him in. Well, that's good. When he come into your heart, 
Did you welcome him to your entire being? There's many people that will welcome Jesus in as Savior. But can he be your Lord? Lord is ownership. The Lord has complete control. You would plentifully welcome him to keep you out of hell and torment. You would welcome him as your savior. But are you willing to welcome him as your Lord to take over full control? In the heart, there is little doors. Like in your house. If I come to your house to visit you, and you welcome me in, and said, Brother Branham, I give to you this house and all that is within it. But then you take me by the hand, and you say, you see this door? I don't want you going in there. And you see this place? Now don't go in there. And this place? Don't go in there. Then I'm just partially welcome. And that's the way people usually receive the Lord Jesus. As partially welcome. But he wants to come in and be welcome. Now let's examine some of these doors. One of them is a little door of self. You know, that's an important little door. You say, oh, yes, Jesus, I will receive you as my Savior. But now don't meddle in my business. That's the attitude of lots of Christians, so-called. Now, I want to live my own life, but I don't want you, to, I want you to keep me from hell. But don't meddle in my affairs. Well, then Jesus can't have the preeminences. Jesus can't be your Lord. Because you want to be your own ruler. And he wants to rule in your place. But as long as you keep the door shut, though you have accepted him as your personal savior, yet you haven't Fully give him preeminence in your, your life. No, churches, isn't that a truth in all the world? They won't let him have lordship. And then there's another little door. It's called the door to selfishness. Oh, how we like to guard that little door with a big padlock. I'll go down if there's anything in it for me. Or if it's for me and my church. Or for me and my denomination. I'll be willing to go if I get anything out of it. That's selfish. You ought to open that door and let Jesus come in. Oh, it's an important door. Now, I don't mean to be rude, but I only mean to be honest. And then there's a little door that's found in the heart of both men and women. It's a little door of pride. And in that you say, come in, Lord, I'll join your church and I'll, uh, I'll uh, pay my tithings. I'll help buy the widow some coal, buy the orphan some food or some clothes. But I just don't want to surrender my pride. I think I'm just a little bit better than so and so. Jesus can't be ruler then of your being. I would go down to that certain church. It's a little mission. I hear they're having a revival. But I couldn't let my...
my society know that I mixed up with that group of people? Sometimes the devils even said they were holy rollers. Oh, how that hurt your pride. I just couldn't open that door, Lord. Then he can't be ruler and Lord. If you keep your door closed. And sometime I've been guilty of having said to the ladies that in the summertime they don't dress nice with their little immoral looking clothes on. I know you say they, they sell them. Yes, and they sell arsenic too. <laughs> Oh, you want to look like the Joneses. You want to act like your neighbor. But God wants you to act like his child and get away from that pride. The pride door. What a horrible thing it is to know that you prefer Fess to be a Christian and then keeping the door closed on him. A little story I perhaps have told you. But in the early days of the slaves in the South, there was, they go by and buy those people and uh, make slaves out of them. And they were sad because they're away from their home and they just simply couldn't feel good no more. They'd never go back home and they were whipped around and beat around till the people were all down in spirit. And one day a slave buyer came by and he was buying some slaves at a plantation. Oh, he noticed one of those men, a young fella, standing straight, his chin up, and they never had to whip him. He was right on the job. So the slave buyer said, Let me have the, that slave. I'll give you your price for him. And the owner said, But he's not for sale. He said, What makes him so much different from the other slaves? Is he a boss? Said, No, he's just a slave. Said, Do you feed him different from the other slaves? Said, No, he eats in the galley. With the rest of the slaves. Said then maybe perhaps. That he's treated a little better. No. He's just treated like the rest of the slaves. Said what makes him so much different than than the other slaves. He said I wondered for a long time myself. But I found out one day. That over in the homelands. His father is a king of the tribe. And yet him being an alien away from home, he still knows that he's a king's son and he conducts himself like one. Oh, we Christians, though alienated from the world and we are heaven bound subjects of the Lord Jesus we should conduct ourselves as sons and daughters of God. Pride keeps us from doing it. We're afraid somebody will say something against us. When the Spirit blesses, many are ashamed to say amen. There is many who in their office work the Lord Jesus could have healed them of diseases and they're afraid to testify to the glory of God because of pride. Many are afraid to stand and say, I have received Christ as my personal Savior and been filled with the Holy Spirit. A shame. Oh, I love that little old song we used to sing years ago. Down in the 
ridge country. I'll take the way with the Lord's despised few. I've started in with Jesus and I'm going through. Not ashamed of the gospel. Paul said it's the power of God. Pride. Oh, what a great thing that is. Then there's another little door in your heart. Oh, there's many of them. But I just want to hit some of the main ones. Another little door in the heart when Jesus comes in is the door of faith. Oh, many will say, I'll accept him as my personal Savior. But I don't believe all the words inspired. Then you're keeping your door closed. He can't bless you at all. And you say, oh, I believe that he saves me from sin. But I just can't believe that the days of miracles are the same today as they were then. Then you're keeping your door closed. He can't do a thing for you. Oh, tonight, in this healing service, if we could only open that door and say, Lord God, Jehovah, I believe every word that you said is the truth. And it is a written, sealed by the blood of the Lord Jesus, a declaration and a promise to me. And it's my property. And I possess it. Oh, what a meeting there would be here tonight. It is mine. Jesus died that I might have this faith. He that cometh unto God must believe that he is. And a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Oh, to open that door of faith. And let the king of glory come into it. Then you will be able to see the great things. And believe with all your heart. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. His manifestation of his love and spirit will be poured out upon you. I wish to hit another door just for a moment. And that is the door of your eyes. The Bible said that we ought to buy eyesay from the Lord. You know, I'm a southerner. And I, down in the country where we live, way back in the mountain country of Kentucky, the children used to get sore eyes. And my grandpa used to hunt. And he used to hunt coons. And he would take that raccoon and render out the grease. And when some of the children got sore eyes, you usually get sore eyes when you're sleeping. That's when Christians get sore eyes too. When they are asleep in the things of the world, their eyes get sore. You look at too much television maybe. Anyhow, it'll make sore eyes. And we used to take this coon grease and rub it, massage it into their eyes until their eyes come open. Oh, but in the spiritual realm, God has some holy oil, the Holy Spirit, and it massages the heart with the power of His resurrection until the spiritual eyes can fly open. And see the glory of the Lord. Oh, how we need an eye massaging. That our eyes of our understanding might be open. Then another thing. When your eyes come open, you can see. You might hear. But your eyes come open, you can see. 
And then when our eyes is opened up, we can see the goodness of the Lord. There's many times that God has walked with you. He kept you from the wreck. He brought you from the hospital. And you go on as if it's like a hog under an apple tree. That's the southern expression. You know, an old hog can get under the apple tree. And the apples will beat him on the head all day long. And he'll just grab them and eat and never look up to where they're coming from. That's the way many Christians do. The blessings of the Lord falling all around them and they never get on their knees to recognize that it comes from God. What a pity it is. Our eyes need to be open. And another reason our eyes should be open. That is when we come into the house of the Lord. And we see His Spirit beginning to move and to perform things just the way He said it would be done. And we sit with our eyes closed. Now, I know that is true. They sit with their eyes closed and say, well, I don't know. It could be mental telepathy. And it could be a fortune teller. But if your eyes were open, Jesus would come in and say, it's me and my word. But you must have your eyes open. And then you would see his goodness and could appreciate all that he does for you. Some time ago, way down in the Southlands, there was a minister of the gospel. And he had a, a man that worked for him, a colored man. And his name, they called him Gabe. His right name was Gabriel, but they called him Gabe for short. And Gabe was a good old fella, but he just couldn't get lined up with the Lord. No matter what we would do, he would just out of line. He liked to play dice and cards and drink a little whiskey and he just couldn't stay lined up. And Gabe liked to hunt real well, but he couldn't hit nothing. And the pastor of this certain church, he liked to hunt also. So one day when they had been out hunting, and they had shot so much game, till the rabbits and the birds were hanging all over them. And it was late in the evening and they were coming up along a little familiar path. No one had said nothing for a few minutes. And old Gabe just loaded down with game, trotting along the path. After a while, he tapped the minister on the shoulder. And he turned around. And to his surprise, tears were running down old Gabe's cheeks. And he said, Parson, you know what I was going to do? He said, No, Gabe, what are you going to do? He said, I was coming right down to your church Sunday morning. I was going to find my position place right down at the Mona's bench. I was going to come in as fellowship in the church. And I'm going to live true to God till I die. And the pastor, rather upset at the quick decision of Gabe, after for years trying to persuade the old fella to become a Christian, he said, Gabe, you don't know how I appreciate that. How happy I am to have you. 
to say those words about our Lord and for your decision. But there's one thing that's a bother me, Gabe. After all my preaching, and I picked you up on the street and tucked you to your wife at home when you were drunk to keep you from being arrested. And all the things that I have done, and still I couldn't get you to come and join the church and be saved. What made the sudden change, Gabe? He said, boss, you know I was a poor shot. I couldn't hit one rabbit. And he said, look here at the rabbits and game that he has given me. Surely he must love me or he wouldn't give them to me. Oh, it's simple. But if you only know the blessings that you possess comes from the hand of God. The clothes that you wear, the food that you eat. If you'd once mission those fields and see those little babies with their little bellies all swelled up laying on the street dying with hunger. And you rake off enough in the garbage can to feed them. You'd get on your knees and say, oh God, I've been so cruel. Realize the goodness of God. How many people that would be in hell tonight that sit in these seats where you're sitting that would give anything if they could take their seat back again tonight and have the opportunity to come? The goodness of God. We just take it for granted. He's so good to come to us in this last days when denominations... And great moves against God. And all kinds of mechanical devices. And everything of entertainment to take the place of the church. All kinds of entertainment. And yet they turn their back on Christ. And yet He comes to us in His goodness to reveal Himself to us. Has the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's beyond anything as those dear people sung a while ago. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. To know His goodness standing, knocking, trying to get in. Think of it just a moment as we bow our heads. For prayer. Are you guilty of eating good food, enjoying good sight, wearing good clothes, driving a good car, living in a great nation, going to a, a good school? And all the blessings that we are enjoying. And yet you never looked up to see where they come from. Are you guilty? Won't you tonight while he's knocking at your door. Do just enough to reach up with your right hand and say Lord. I now unopen the door. Come in O king of glory. And save me. And open up the doors of my heart. I do my door of faith. My door of pride. My door of indifference. My door of selfishness. All the doors of my heart I swing open to you. Oh Lord Jesus. Who is standing present now. Will you do it by just raising up your hand while everybody's praying. God bless you all over the church. There's many hands. I can't count them all. But God sees everyone. What about the balcony up there? You know what? Geographically speaking, you're just a little closer to heaven than they are down here. That's right. Put up your hands and say, God.
I want to recognize tonight that Jesus, God's Son, gives me everything that I eat. All of my clothes and my whatever He gives me. Lord, I thank You and I want to open my heart. My door of faith, I want You to come in and take possession. And I want You to open my eyes. Oh Lord, I've sat in the meetings. I've heard Brother Branham and many of the ministers talk about you being the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I've tried hard to believe that. And I've really seen your power come and unfold the secrets of the heart. I've seen you speak through your servants to absolutely strange people. And would know who they were, the sins that they were doing, the sickness that was in their bodies. And I've seen you heal them from all the way blindness, sickness, insanity, and have set them free. And somehow I've kept my own little door of faith closed. God be merciful to me tonight, say. And open my door of faith. Would them people raise their hands to God? Open up my door, Lord. God bless you. That's right. God bless you. Open my door of faith, Lord. I open it to you. Come in. Be Lord. Be ruler. Take me as I am. I'm no good. You might as well confess it. What is man that thou art mindful of him? I don't mean this rude. I love you and God loves you. But without God, you're no good anyhow. You're just six foot of dust where you're going and that's it in a soul to hell. But if you're born again, you're a child of God. Open your door then and let Him have lordship over your being. Look at Him, what He does while you're talking to Him now. Look at Peter when He come. Jesus knew who He was. He said, Thou art Simon. And after this you're going to be called Peter. And your father's name is Jonas. He told Philip where Nathaniel found him. Or Nathaniel where Philip found him. And he also knowed the secret of the Samaritan woman's heart. That one who touched his garment, he turned and looked. He perceived the thoughts of the people that said he was Beelzebub. He's still the same tonight. He said, these things that I do shall you also. And that you will come into their heart as Lord and Savior. Bless those who raise their hands, who has already accepted you, but have not fully opened every door in their heart. Grant, Lord, that every door may be open now, that the Son of glory will come in, and anoint their eyes that they might see His glory and His presence. Get glory to Thyself, Lord, for I, as Your servant, present them to You as the trophies of the message. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. As many as believe was added to the church. They believe and accepted Christ. But I do love to see the altar and people at it repenting. No matter how much you cried, how much you begged, until your faith looked there and accepted Him as your personal Savior, it would do you no good to pray or cry. Peter said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and them that's at Chicago and as many as far off. Just as many as the Lord our God shall call. And if you raise your hand, he's still calling. Believe him now. I wonder before we start the meeting, and I could say this, go to some good church now and be baptized and 
Call on the name of the Lord and he'll give you the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now do that for me, won't you? No matter what church you affiliate with, as long as you receive the Holy Spirit, that settles it. You're son and daughter of God. And I forgot something that the Lord reminded me of. They told me that they'd taken a love offering for me a while ago. Wasn't necessary. I've never took an offering in my life. The brothers usually come around and give me something to live on. Thank you for it. I don't mean to be rude. I'm sorry. You forgive me for forgetting to say that vital thing that you did. I appreciate it. The Lord bless you. It'll go to the best of my knowledge to the kingdom of the Lord. It's the only way I have of living and feeding my family is by what you give to me for that purpose. Anything over that goes straight into the missions. So when I answer it that day, I want him to say, It was well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the words I'm longing to hear. Well done. Now, is there any people here that has never been in one of our meetings before? Would you just raise your hands? This is your first time. Oh, that's very fine. The Lord bless you richly. About 200 or 300 people, I guess, that's never been in the meetings. Now, I want to take just this moment of time, which is early yet, to explain to you what I think about divine healing. Now, you know, on these kind of a ministry, you have all kinds of names. And some of them are not very pleasant. But however, it doesn't change the bit with God. He was Beelzebub to the people of that day that didn't believe him. And if they call the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call them of the household? But just the same, the gospel moves right on. And there's no way of stopping it. It's just like a house on fire in a high wind. It's going to move on. No one's going to stop the gospel. It'll take its roots in their hearts no matter how bad they persecute. Someone, God is able of these stones to rise children to Abraham. And now in this day, I know that it's a, a very fine thing that you would be careful what you hear. Because to me, I believe that God can do many things that He hasn't written in His Word. I know that He's God. He does anything He wishes to. But to me, I like for it to come out of the Word, then I'm sure. In the Old Testament, they had a way of testing whether a prophet was true or not. It was on the Urim Thundum. And you Bible readers know what that was. It was a supernatural light that went over the breastplate of Aaron that reflected different colors. And if the dreamer or the prophet spoke, and no matter how real it sound, if the Urim and the Thundum did not reflect that supernatural, it wasn't so. And in that priesthood, the Urim Thundum was taken away. But in this priesthood of the Lord, we got another Urim Thundum. That's His Word. If it doesn't reflect on the Word, I'm just a little bit skeptic of it. For whosoever shall take away or add to anything that's written in this book, you know the threat of the angel in Revelations. I don't want any more than what's in it, and I don't want anything less than what's in it. I want just what He promised. And I would not come to you to deceive you. I would come as your brother. And surely all these years that I've been here, God has let you see some way that I, I love you, and I'm your brother. And as myself, I believe tonight if the rapture would come and they... When according to your worthiness, I would perhaps be the last one to go. I don't say that to be humble. I say that because I was born out of season to you people of this great message. There's men and women sitting here who are 
gray-headed that was preaching the gospel before I was born. Certainly they're worthy. They was back there. You only paved the way for this. And you've looked forward to it. And it's here. So let's believe it. Now when the Lord Jesus was here, I'm going to take my campaign theme for the newcomers. And if you all that's been in a meeting before, just bear with me a minute. Divine healing is nothing that any man can do for you. It's something that someone has already done for you. Jesus Christ died for you at Calvary and he was wounded for your transgressions and with his stripes you were healed. That's the word. Then the only thing he could do would be manifest himself in some way by preaching the word. Now, did you notice Brother Osborne is a preacher? He could place the word out there in such a way till the people accepted it. I'm not able to do that. But the Lord has given me another way to bring it. Just like the eye or the mouth. You wouldn't have much use for your eye if you didn't have any mouth. Where you preach or where you see. They're both important gifts of the body if the body continues. Now, when Jesus manifested himself to the Jews. Now, I asked you any time in the Bible. Jesus manifested himself to the Jews. If this isn't the way he did it. Nathaniel or Philip was converted by the Lord Jesus. He had seen him doing great signs and wonders. He went to find a friend many miles, we were told, around a mountain. His name was Nathaniel. He was a real good church member and an honest man. And Nathaniel was under a tree praying when Philip come up. And he said, come see who we found, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He said, now could there be any good thing come from Nazareth? Out of that bunch down there? Worse than holy rollers, I suppose. Could there be any good thing come from there? And I think he'd give him the best answer that any man could. He said, come see for yourself. And along the road, he began to tell him the works that Jesus did, like I'm telling you now. He prepared him for what could happen. Well, I can hear Philip say... Nathaniel, you know what? When Peter came up to him, he had never seen him. And he told him what his name was and who his daddy was, where he lived at. Why, he even perceives their thoughts. The people were thinking evil of him. Said he was an evil spirit uh, doing the works. And he turned around and said, you speak that against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven you. But when the Holy Ghost is come and does it, you speak one word against it, it'll never be forgiven you. That's today. Jesus said so. Now, when Nathaniel and his friend Philip walked up into the audience slowly, where great crowds were standing and Jesus was preaching or ministering to them, Jesus fastened his eyes on, here come one of his disciples with a strange man. Jesus looked at him and was empowered with spirit. And there was an honest Jew. And he said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Now, he would never know him by his dressing because all men dressed alike. And that struck the little Jew. And he said, Rabbi, when did you know me? Otherwise, you've never seen me. Now, I've never seen you. But Jesus was manifesting himself. He said, you never see me, i never seen you, and how would you know that I was a just and honest man? Why, he said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. Desire to have these tapes of the night service, just write to Leo Mercener, Jeffersonville, Indiana. How do you spell your name, Leo? Last name. M-E-R-C-I-E-R. The tapes are sold almost at cost. Three dollars and something, I believe. Three dollars even. And Leo Mercer, 
Jeffersonville, Indiana, is and Gene Gold here is the tape boys, the official tape boys of the campaign. And they've taken this position so that they could go around in the meeting. They are my brothers and my friends in the gospel. Mr. Gold here is right from your city or close to it here. Mr. Mercer was formerly a Catholic from up here in Michigan somewhere, I believe. They formed their little FBI party and come down to find out whether that gift was true or not. They found it, as the Lord always does. And now they've been with me for some time. How long have you been along, Brother Mercer? Four years. Found them to be real honest boys, right on the mark. And so just write to them for the, for the tapes, if you desire them, for your tape machines. All right. One, two, three, four. Who has prayer card number five? What was that number now again? D? D number five. Anyone have it? Raise up your hand, lady. Number six. Who has D number six? The gentleman. Number seven. Quickly now, if we can see your hand. So seven, eight. I've never seen this woman in my life as far as I know. We're strangers to each other, are we, lady? We are. Just so the audience out there would know, as we stand here, just raise your hand so they might not see your head nodding. At, we, we've never seen each other before. And here we stand, man and woman. Thank you, lady. Now, I'll talk to her just a moment, like our blessed Lord did to the woman at, at the well at Samaria. And now, if the Lord Jesus wants to manifest Himself to the Gentile, then He'll do the same act that He did then. Is that right? If He's the same, He's got to be the same in principle, the same in word, the same in action. The only thing that He isn't the same in, that is His corporal body, because He's in your body. I am the vine, He said, ye are the branches. He turned back to light where He come from, the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel, he turned back to that. How many believe that? Well, he said so. Did he prove it? When Paul met him on the road to get down there, he was a light. And when Peter was in prison, he was a light. He's the eternal light. Now, if this, our sister standing here, I have no idea what you're here for. I've never seen you. I, I don't know one thing about you. But now, it'll be according to her approach. How many of you in the prayer line and you out there know that it's your re approach to a gift? How many knows that? If you approach it reverently, you get what you ask. If you don't, you do not. We'll appreciate if you don't take any pictures while Reverend Branham prays for the sick. Yes. Please. I uh, thank you. The angel of the Lord is a light. How many have seen the picture of it? Let's see your hands. Sure, it's here. See, they got it back there. It's in Washington, D.C. The only supernatural beam was ever proved by that. It, and see, and then when the light of the angel comes down, it's just a great light, kind of a yellowish green looking light. And I'm watching that light and it'll move and go to the audience. I have to watch it because the vision is with the light. And then when you take a camera picture, it, sometimes it upsets me. And so I appreciate it. If you want to take a picture right now, the brother was taking them or whoever it is, you're welcome right now. But just when, it's, um, when we start in the discernment, you see, to see if the Lord will do it. Now, if the Lord will do the same act here that he did to the woman at the well, how many say, I solemnly will believe him with all my heart. My Father, thou seest this. Now let thy spirit come now and manifest the message and declare it to be the truth. Grant it, Father, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if the blessed Lord now will reveal to me what you're here for or something like he did in the Bible, like he did to Philip or like he did to some of the, rat, the woman at the well or some of his works. Now, you know then, if we don't know each other, it'll have to be a supernatural power to do it. But then it'll be according to what you think it is. If you say it's an evil spirit, then you'll get an evil spirit's reward. If you think it's the spirit of God, then you'll get God's reward. That is right. Now, may he grant it is my sincere prayer. Now, we're talking about approaching a gift. <clears throat> that little woman had touched his garment... She believed he was the Son of God. She got just what she asked for. 
But the Roman soldier who put a, a rag over his eyes and hit him on the head and said, Now, if you're a prophet, tell us who hit you. He never got nothing. But a trip to the regions of the lost. To never return again. It's approach. Now, if the Lord Jesus will... If I said, Woman, you're sick. And uh, God will heal you. Well, you, you could doubt that. You'd have to take my word for that. But if the angel of the Lord will go back into your life and, and reveal something that you've been in your life, like he did the woman at the well or something like that, then you'll know whether that's the truth or not. You'll know that. Then you'd, if he's right there, he's right everywhere. Then you'd believe if he knows what was, he certainly will know what will be. Now, I don't know just whether the audience can hear my voice now or not. But between me and the woman stands the eternal light of God. The woman's conscious that something's going on. She's suffering. She has something wrong. She keeps holding her head. She has headaches. And she's got something wrong with her blood which is diabetes. That's true. Do you believe? Now watch, more you would talk to her, more would be said. Ben, this is the last night for a while. Let's talk to the woman just a moment. So if there's someone feeling it, that could just been guessing that. Not with our hands up to God. It wasn't guessing that was my voice, but it wasn't me speaking. Now, what he said to you, I don't know. I'll know when I play the tape. But whatever it was, was the truth. And I see it was something that's, yes, it's sugar in the blood. Diabetes. And it causes dizzy spells and headaches and so forth. And then I see someone appearing, which is a, a boy. It's your son. And you're praying for him. He's backsliding, going away from God. Then there's someone else, which is an aged woman, with you now here. That's your mother. If I, by the Holy Spirit, can tell you what your mother's wanting, do you think she would accept it? It's her leg. That's right. That's truth. You're not from this city. You're from a place like Rosala, Illinois. Mrs. Fred Grenier, that's your name. Go home. You receive what you've asked for. Your faith has did it. God bless you. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. I don't move. See, each of you is a spirit. And when you move, your spirit is subject to the Holy Spirit now. And when you move, it does something. You remember Jesus put everyone out of the house while he raised the little girl to life? You know an enemy would make you be scared and running and everything. But that's sweet. You just want to worship it like. Between you and I is that light. That lights man that comes into the world. And if the Lord Jesus and His blessed will will permit me to know what you're here for, would you believe with all your heart? You have something wrong in your throat trouble and you have something wrong in your chest that's right do you believe the same God that talked to the disciples and know that still lives today you live on a street called Adams Street your number is 3239 West Adams Street your name is Myrtle Bradford, go home. Jesus has made you there in the audience with your hand on your little boy. Yes, you. Yes, sir. 
You was in prayer at that time. And something is moving on you. You're aware of that. For you've touched something. You never touched me. You touched him. And you're praying with your hand on your little one because the little boy is suffering with a nervous condition that upsets him so much in school. That's thus saith the Lord. Now while the Spirit's on you, lay your hand on him. O oh Lord God, I rebuke the devil that's bothering this child. May it leave him in Jesus' name. Amen. You shall have what you ask for. Don't weary. The man is 30 yards from me. What did he touch? God said in his word that he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. You believe him. You believe, lady? Thank you. If the Holy Spirit will let me know what you're wanting, just as he did that man out there, you have a prayer card. You're here on the platform. That man's just sitting in the audience. Will you believe? You're not here for yourself. You have a lady's trouble, but not to bother you much, but you, you're here for your husband. And he isn't here. Neither is it in this city, nor in this state. He's in a state where there's a lot of lakes. Wisconsin. He suffers with multiple sclerosis. And he's unsaved. And you're more concerned about his soul than you are his healing. That's thus saith the Lord. Now the handkerchief that you're going to wipe those tears with, lay it on him and don't doubt. You can have what you ask for. Amen. The Lord bless you, lady. How do you do? I suppose that we're meeting our first time. That is right. Do you believe God heals epilepsy, sir, sitting on the end of the seats back there? Do you believe He'd make you well? If you believe with all your heart, accept it, you're going to have your healing. <laughs> Being that you missed it, what do you think about it sitting there looking at the glasses on, suffering with asthma? Do you believe that God will make you well? Then receive it. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'm asking him to do something else. All right, lady, you're so happy sitting there with heart trouble. He heals you too. All right. Amen. Just believe on the Lord Jesus. He's the fairest of ten thousands. The rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. The morning star. I don't mean to keep you there, lady. I just have to move as he moves. We're strangers to each other. If the Holy Spirit, by the resurrection of the Lord, will do tell me what you're praying for, standing there with your eyes closed, will you believe with all your heart? It doesn't show, but you have an inward garter, and you have an extreme nervous condition you're praying for. Don't weary, that's turning loose. You're not from this city, nor from this state, or from this nation. You're a Canadian. You're from Ontario, a great country of cedar, don't even belong in here in Evergreen. You're praying for someone else too up there, a relative, a woman, and she has cancer, and that's on the thyroid gland. Lay your handkerchief on her, and she will be well too, if thou will only believe. Almighty God, grant the blessings that's been asked. Amen. God bless you now. Don't doubt, just believe. Don't move, please. If you'll just wait a few more minutes, we'll, we'll just stay.
Oh, may the good Lord of heaven grant it. It was somewhere. Wait, we start with this person. Now, you just give me just about five, ten minutes. I guess I'm a stranger to this lady. Is that right, lady? We are strangers to each other. But the Lord Jesus knows you. Do you believe that He can reveal to me what's your trouble? You're here for your back. You got a back condition that was caused from an experience in a hospital from an operation. That's right. You believe He would make you well? They call you Ann Robley. You're from a suburb of this city. That's your daughter standing right down there. You got skin cancer. Surrender your card and go back to your seat. Your husband has dizzy spells. Tell him just to believe and all three of you will be healed in the name of the Lord. Now go believing. Have faith. Don't doubt. Just a moment. The little lady sitting here with her head bowed just behind this gentleman with a tumor. Do you believe that God heals you then when you were praying? You do? Wave your hand if you accept it. All right. You can have it. <laughs> Bennett, he's so close to you. The lady next to you there is suffering with an eye condition. You believe God would heal you, the colored lady? Yes, ma'am. All right. You believe it? What do you think sitting next to her with arthritis? Do you believe God would heal you? Raise up your hand. Accept it. All right. Then you can be healed. Oh, have faith in God. Don't doubt. The man that's next to me here, I, I don't know you, sir. We're strangers to each other. Now, if you can believe, all things are possible to them that believe. Something happened. It was a man. The gentleman sitting looking this way, right back there, something white, checkered looking shirt on with, well, he's got heart trouble. If he will believe with all of his heart, the Lord Jesus will make you well. You believe it. Next, there is a rupture. Do you believe it? God would heal you and make you well. You believe it? Then you can have it. All right. Have faith. Don't doubt. The man sitting next to you has got stomach trouble that he wants the Lord to heal him. A little thin looking fellow with his hair combed back like that, a bow tie on. Got a nervous stomach, sir. You believe that the Lord Jesus healed you? He did. Your sins are gone. Just be thankful. Oh, how could you doubt the precious Lamb of God? How many believes that He's raised from the dead, that He's here? That the message is true, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What's left? What can be done? Wipe away the little darkness from your face and around your eyes and let it be anointed with God's eye save and just receive him. Believe him. What more can he do? You with cards, you without cards, it doesn't matter. Little lady sitting right in front of me in the balcony with the lady's trouble sitting there. Do you believe God will make you well? If you do, yes, ma'am, you can have what you ask for. God bless you. He heals you. You, sir, now you believe with all your heart. We are strangers to each other. I've never seen you in my life. And I'll tell you now, this is the first time you've ever seen me. You've never been in one of my meetings before. This is your first time. That's right. And you're here suffering with something wrong in your throat. And you have a stomach trouble. That's right. It's gas on your stomach. You're nervous. 
You used to have a job that you're ashamed of now. You worked in a nightclub. You was an entertainer in a nightclub. That's right. Your name is Edge. R.H. Edge is your name. Your wife is here with you. She's in the meeting. If God will tell me what's wrong with your wife, will you accept her healing too? It's your foot. That's right. Correct. You're not from this city. You're from a place, you're below a big city, south of a big city, about 25 miles, Springfield, Illinois. Now go home and receive your healing and be well in the name of the Lord Jesus. God bless you, sir. Have faith in God. Do you believe? You think God would heal that arthritis? If you can believe it. What do you think sitting there, lady? You come here, man. Stand right there a minute. Come here, lady. You think God would heal that diabetes and make you well? You believe it? All right. If you can believe it, you can have what you ask for. All right. What do you think, lady? Come here a minute. You look like a healthy woman, but you're anemic. <laughs> you believe that God will make you well? You do? How many out there is, has got diabetes? Stand to your feet just a minute. You'll see the glory of God. How many out there has got arthritis? Will stand to your feet. How many out there that's anemic? Stand to your feet. Anywhere, no matter where you are. Every devil will have to obey God. Certainly it will. All right. Lady here, come this here just a minute. I've got to get you from between them women. Do you believe God will heal that tumor and make you well? you believe it? How many is fixing to be for a tumor now? Raise up to your feet. The devil's defeated. It don't take a whole group. It just takes sincerity. It just takes if you believe and have faith. Ladies, stand up. There, move right up here. All of us got back trouble like the lady. Stand up on your feet. Believe with all your heart. You see what I mean? How many suffering with nervousness stand on your feet? That's all over the building. <laughs> Certainly I can feel it. I know it. Cancer, stand to your feet. Do you believe anybody's got anything wrong with them? Stand to your feet. Oh, this is that. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, this is that. This is what you've raised to your feet. You stand now in the presence of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Do you solemnly believe that His presence is here? Raise your hands. You pray with me. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. And God shall raise them up. Every devil is defeated. Don't you see? He's exposed. He's got to leave you. He'll leave if you let him leave right now. Christ is driving him from you. Oh God, in Jesus' name I rebuke every devil that's holding these people. Come out of them, Satan, that they can be made well. In the name of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Raise up your hands now and praise him. And be free in Jesus Christ's holy name. Hallelujah.